Hi, I'm Old Miller Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. I'm back with another one of my Saturday videos about something I want to talk about other than Old Norse. You're getting a lot of Wednesday videos that are excessively researched, so bear with me for some Saturday videos about dinosaurs and guns in Colorado and stuff. With me today is my good friend Matthew Mossbrucker, director, curator at the Morse Natural History Museum, and we're going to talk a little bit about a dinosaur. What dinosaur? We're going to talk about a patasaurus. I usually do this door to door while I will knock, usually at dinner time and ask you if you have a moment for a pandasaurus. Do you leave a leaflet if no one is home? Of course I do. Okay. Yeah, but you have to give me a donation in order for me to give you the real leaflet so that you would have a deeper understanding of what it means to be a pandasaurus. The kingdom hall of the pandasaurus witnesses? Okay. Yeah, I figured it would be a good thing to do to start a religion because you don't make a lot of money in paleo. No, I went in on the ground floor of this. Okay, we got this. What's the title of the hit priest? Me. Gotcha question. <laughs> <laughs> me. All right. Okay, so let me tell you what we're working on here. This is really fun. Um, this is normally kind of the shtick that we do with museum goers as they come into my working lab to see the dinosaurs that we're cleaning. So first of all, Dr. Crawford, I would like to show you this dinosaur toy. Who is this? What is this? Well, this puts me in the position of Fry in that Futurama meme where he's wondering if he needs to pronounce the Spanish word as it's pronounced in Spanish and sound correct, or pronounced as it sounds in English and not sound like a pretentious door. So part of me wants to say brontosaurus, this is what everybody knows, part of me wants to say a patasaurus to be pretentious. Well, and I think that's a good thing. And I think um, being pretentious is fun. I do it all the time. Uh, it is a hobby. But this dinosaur, if you called it either, you could be correct. Um, because this is a sculpture that's not terribly accurate and you could weave it into either the brontosaurus or a patasaurus paradigm. But for the sake of argument right now, we're going to call this dinosaur a patasaurus. Now here in Morrison, Colorado, uh, this is a famous dinosaur because the very first apatosaurus ever collected was found here in Morrison in 1877 by a man named Arthur Lakes. He found most of the skeleton and it's a big thing. If you were to stretch out the dinosaur, you would be able to park three big yellow school buses end to end to end, and that would be the length of the dinosaur. If you had eight female Asian elephants, which are conveniently packaged at about 10,000 pounds a piece, and you duct tape them together, which you shouldn't do because that's mean, that would be the same biomass, 80,000 pounds, roughly 100 feet long, great big dinosaur. We're in the second story of the museum's building, and looking out into our parking lot, out these windows here, if we had a living apatosaurus, you would see nothing but its rump. It is a big dinosaur. That's an amazing sense of scale, actually, to get yeah, it that way. It's, yeah, it really is a big dinosaur. Just the thigh bone. And the second individual apatosaurus that was found here in Morrison was about 2,030 millimeters tall. So that's six feet, six inches tall. It is a big dinosaur, but not every part of the body's big. The head in this little toy is too big for the toy. It is too big. I mean, you shrink it down, it's a little smaller than a horse's head. Uh, if you can hand me the skull. Which is incredible. Yeah, to about. It's, just, it's a tiny head. Small enough to run for public office. So this is a cast, um, well, part of a cast, partly a sculpture, of the cousin of a patasaurus. This is a diplodocus, or diplodocus, or if you're British, diplodocus, I don't care. Now, the head in these dinosaurs, they're hard to read if you're used to cows and horses and humans, because there are extra holes. Mm. Can you point out where you think the eye goes, Dr. Crawford? Where does the eye go? I think it's this. I think you're right. Because it's a diapsid, right? It is. Well, there's, we use new words now, but the bones never change. Sure. Nomenclature does. My, my 80s, 90s dinosaur books told me this was a diapsid skull. It's cool. Skull, so. it's cool. It, they'll change again. Uh, but right here you have where the eye would belong, and there's a little pressure dent left by the eye right here. It's roughly the size of a clementine orange. So the next time you eat a cutie, you call them bronto eyeballs. It's kind of fun. It makes the kids want to eat them more. Um, this hole and this hole, what do you think they have to do with the ear? I don't know, just analogizing to something like a horse, I might think this was some jaw muscle attachment here or something like that. You're too smart for your own good. Okay. You're right, because that's exactly what these are doing. These are expansion slots for jaw muscles. So when they flex and get larger, 
they have a place to go. When you ask most dino geeks where the ears go in a skull like this, they're going to point at this aperture or this one. Not so not is so. the ear. This is fun because if you can find the notch made by the wing of the brain case and the bone at the top back corner of the skull, of the skull muscle, make it a cute little notch and then the eardrum is always behind this long strut that oh. connects the brain case eventually down to the lower jaw, up the quadrate, and the ear goes right there, embryologically, oh, embryologically, I can talk. So there you go, so there's the ear, huh. and that's a trick you can use with any dinosaur head, by the by. How does it, how does it relate to where the brain is? It just seems different Oh, the brain? Us. Oh, ask me about the brain in just one minute. Okay. Okay, well, we will we'll get to the brain, I promise. So, looking right here, you see this aperture mm -hmm. in front of the eye? What do you think that is? I suppose I don't know what it's for. Okay, this, we have a big name for it. It is antiorbital fenestra, and, or you can just call it the air pocket. That's fine by me. Okay. You don't need large pretentious words all the time. So this air pocket is located in front of the eye. Uh, folks do mistake that for the nose, but as it turns out, the nostrils are up here at the top of the head. Wow, so that's actually somewhat elephant-like, isn't it? Yeah, kinda. Yeah, elephants do have their uh, the nasal openings in between the eyes and people have proposed that there may have been a short trunk like a tapir on these skulls I don't see the evidence for that quite honestly. It's a neat speculation. It's a fun idea um, However from the maxillary foramen right here There is some indications of plumbing flowing out onto the bones of the snout giving these dinosaurs lips big smoochy hmm. moose lips Oh, Bakker mentioned something about that. Yeah, we've been talking about that for years. That's in a paper that we're writing together. So this is the general outline of the skull, but of course skulls in dinosaurs, and skulls in humans, are not single units. They're made up of lots of little bones sure. that come together. And in these skulls, they, in many cases, don't really fuse together. The joints between the individual bones are loose, and consequently the bones of the skull fall away from each other hmm. after death. So if you want to put that back, and you we asked were about, to say something about the brain. I was, I was. Yeah. And speaking of bones coming apart, I'm gonna grab this guy. So this is the brain case of Brontosaurus. And speaking of the brain, so this little knob is the occipital condylus, is what clicks the head to the neck. And the spinal cord begins right where my finger is now. And of course, if I stick my finger into this hole, it's going into the brain cavity. But if you look right here, that's where the sense of smell, the stock of the sense of smell region of the brain terminates. Okay. So just from here to here, basically the volume of my thumb is where the brain goes, is the size of the brain in this dinosaur. So <laughs> it's, that's... it's not doing its own taxes. Yeah. So <laughs> well. yeah, it's, it's, and it, it's, a, it's a simple piece. Well, I mean, the ratio between brain and body size works with mammals, doesn't work with anything that's not a mammal. And even though we understand sure. the general shape of the brain and the various lobes that control the sense of sight, smell, hearing, etc., we don't know how it's wired, how the neural pathways are actually forged through the brain. So who knows what these guys were capable of doing. Again, probably not their own taxes, but could run for public office in the U.S. Now, have you phrenologically analyzed this animal to see yeah. if, it's, if it's very organized or if it's very pessimistic. Or... This particular bump tells you that this dinosaur is dead. <laughs> wow. You're welcome. Uh, I have a gift. That's uh, that's what you go to school for, huh? Mm -hmm. Or not. Yeah. So, this bone is fun. Now, I didn't focus in on the teeth in the diplodocus skull that I just showed you. The teeth are right here. And this is the jawbone that is dominant on the side of the muzzle. You can see the air pocket right here, the antorbital fenestra, which by the way, I had a group of adults mishear me and they thought I called it the antorbital Tony Danza. So I will be renaming all of the anatomical landmarks in dinosaur skulls after the cast of Who's the Boss yeah, in my, my next paper, just, just so you know. Are we headed toward an okay boomer source? Uh, maybe. You know, we haven't gotten to internet memes yet, but we will. Don't, don't get me wrong. What's fun about this particular maxilla, which is, this is the same bone that you have in your skull right here that sprouts most of the teeth in your top jaw, 
So you have this nice dental arcade of pig-like teeth. No chewing teeth, this dinosaur would swallow stones, act like grit. So that would grind up the plant material that this dinosaur would eat. And right here, this anorbital fenestriga had this air pocket. This is the fun part of the head because the closer that I look at the shape of this aperture in the heads of Apatosaurus's cousins, so as a group we call them Apatosaurines, that this is how you can tell um, one species apart from another. This is where there's okay. the biggest difference. Now, I'm gonna focus on the head that's behind you that's come apart in this rock. So this rock is a very hard sandstone and it was found here in Morrison, Colorado. I actually identified these fossils a number of years ago. And this particular dark brown bone that's right here, keep your eyes on it. And we have the cast of the Brontosaurus maxilla. This is a Pythosaurus. This is Brontosaurus. So, dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. So this guy, the ant orbital Tony Danza, if you will, mm -hmm large and round, incises into this thin part, the ascending ramus. Still thick in Brontosaurus, thins down in Apatosaurus. You see this in a Brontosaurus, the shape is a nice oval, whereas it's rounded and expanded within Apatosaurus. There are differences within the teeth of these dinosaurs, the number of teeth in the dinosaurs too, uh, not to mention the shape of parts of the brain case, the neck, and so on and so forth. They're actually very different dinosaurs, as it turns out. So guess how many of these Apatosaurus Ajax snouts I have seen since 1877, when the first Apatosaurus was dug up? Oh, well, I'll go daring and say two. Well, I'll subtract one. All right, one. This is it. Yeah. Huh. I've seen other specimens labeled as Apatosaurus Ajax, but they turn out to be the more primitive cousin of Apatosaurus Ajax, something that we're going to give another name to because it's weird. Huh. Um, when it comes right down to it, these individual bones that do come together, like for example, this long skinny bone, mm -hmm. which fits next to the maxilla here, it's called the pre-maxilla. You have a weak suture in your palate when you're a kid that holds your incisors that you can still see. If you use the word to skeletonize your child's skull, which you shouldn't because that's not okay. But um, in dinosaurs, they have a dominant premaxilla, usually with four teeth. Hmm. Although with Apatosaurus, probably still have four teeth, but that's bigger than the teeth are. Might have one or two extra. Probably not, but it's big. At the end of the day, a detailed study of new fossils that we keep finding from Apatosaurus, these long necked dinosaurs, gives us a better idea of how these late Jurassic dinosaurs are actually related to one another. And there's more diversity than we thought for a long time. So what is the takeaway about the term Apatosaurus versus the generic term Brontosaurus? Well, and by generic, I'm saying genus. I'm not trying, right. I'm not trying to make one sound like it's the knockoff, but the... The knockoff, it's the, uh, it's the uh, store brand version. Yeah. <laughs> store brand Brontosaurus. It's a store brand Brontosaurus. Store brand Brontosaurus. When it, you look at the history of the names and nomenclature of these animals, uh, it does get complicated because they were initially named with very small samples, a skeleton, in, in which researchers tended to focus on single regions of the bodies. Mm. And as people have dug, they have found more and more skeletons that help us to better understand these animals through time. So the more data, the better in paleontology, um, as, as it is true with any science. So our ideas with these new data uh, that are coming out of the ground really do change how we view these animals. And then sometimes we have some, some cultural or historic baggage that kind of forces our view of these animals into sure. a bit of a bottleneck. But um, you look at them with fresh eyes, you see a lot of diversity in these animals through the at least nine million years worth of time that this family of dinosaurs was just trying to adapt and, and survive in very harsh Jurassic climates in Western North America. Doesn't the, just trying to recall this, isn't there like a 1906 paper or something that identified brontosaurus with apatosaurus and that's what the whole pedantic correction about brontosaurus versus apatosaurus goes back to? Not to be that kid, the kid that said, actually, 
but actually it was 1903. Oh, well, okay. Okay, so do you want do you want to hear the whole long boring story? Because it is so boring, and nobody gets it right. I'm curious. I because okay, the How original. Time you had? Time? These people can stop listening whenever they want. Sweet, they probably have uh, by now. Yeah, I would. You know, the the, the version of the story, as I vaguely seem to remember, okay. is that. Or, or the correction that I was always told as a kid is that Brontosaurus is somehow a combination of like a Camarasaur and some Apatosaurus bones. Is that roughly something right? Mm, that kind of happened. Uh, I hear that. I do. But long story short, um, we have to travel back to 1877. Here in Morrison, Colorado, when the first skeleton of this thing was dug up, sent from Colorado to New Haven, the Yale Peabody Museum, where Othniel Charles Marsh zeroed in on the dinosaur sacrum. It's buck, okay. right? So we're looking at the fused vertebrae in the hips, right in there. And he counted them and saw that there were three. They're from another site, there's a forgotten giant called Atlantosaurus, Montanus, and from Atlantosaurus, there were four vertebrae that were fused. And hmm. Professor Marsh thought that you could discern one genus of these Jurassic longnecks from another by counting the, these fused bones between the hips. Okay. Because in 1879, when he had his crew dug up not one but two brontosaurus skeletons in the same quarry, he counted five fused vertebrae. Hmm. Okay. And that's, that was his basis, his rationale for separating these animals that had a similar body shape, but some modest differences in his eye. And 1903 rolls around, this is after Marsh's death, and a bigger sample of these sacra had been collected in the American West. Okay. A man named Elmer Riggs performed a really interesting study where he looked at the ontogeny of these dinosaurs, so how they, their bodies would grow and change. Um, as they would age. And he found that the three sacrum was a nucleus in which as these animals would mature and they added mass to the hips and thighs, that they would add a couple vertebrae from the lower back, and vertebra from the tail into this big fused mass just to keep the hips together, keep them from falling apart. <clears throat> yeah. So, but it doesn't end there. He proposed not only an alternative name it, um, I won't mention um, because it's difficult to pronounce for sauropods and he said that yes um, by the way um, these are modest differences based on age and in the shoulders a patasaurus and brontosaurus look pretty much the same in the view of the hips look pretty much the same and they do and the reason why they were separated was based upon an age-related characteristic which is true sure. so he felt that we should synonymize the genus brontosaurus with the genus apatosaurus because the laws that govern the naming of living things states that indeed the name given to an organism first is the name that sticks right the law of priority and taxonomic ambulance chasers have used that uh, for years to mess up kids books as it turns out, um, the paper didn't get a lot of traction uh, when the big apatosaurian skeleton was mounted in New York in 1905. The museum paleontologist Osborne and Granger decided to call it Brontosaurus. Mm -hmm. New York being the cultural hub that it was, that, that skeleton, in my mind at least, helped to cement the idea of, of Brontosaurus as the giant long neck in pop culture for sure. the most of the 20th century, at that time, kind of supplanted uh, Diplodocus, hmm. which was the big famous guy. It wasn't until 1978 when, at all this time, we were putting the wrong type of head on this body. Well, uh, two researchers, uh, both of whom are wonderful guys, uh, Berman and McIntosh, uh, wrote a paper that put this long snouted pencil toothed head on this thick necked body, uh, which looks wrong. It does mm -hmm. look wrong, but they pointed out that this pencil toothed head was found near the Apatosaur neck at Dinosaur National Monument. Oh, and at Morrison, Colorado, there was a brain case found along with the first Apatosaur skeleton. They look similar, not exactly the same, but similar enough that they're very broad. And that we've been putting the wrong head on this dinosaur all this time. Because when you look at the neck, 
and kind of forgive early paleontologists because the neck of these dinosaurs live like linebacker necks. They're mm. big and thick and chunky, and they have these tiny heads. And right. they unexpected. They, yeah, a little yeah. unexpected. Uh, so they, they they either sculpted as they did like Lowell Richard Sw uh, Swan Lowell sculpted this funny hippo long neck dinosaur looking head that Yale had initially. Um, and, or a head that looks like a Haplocanthosaurus, or which looks like a Chimerosaurus, kind of, if you're, you know, inebriated. Um, these massive heads with big spoon-like teeth. Totally wrong head. Couldn't be more wrong. But it aesthetically was more appealing than these tiny pencil heads. Mm. Um, and at that time, in 1978, they reminded the public that, oh, by the way, Rhinosaurus was formally synonymized with the Patasaurus back in 1903. So that when I was a little dino geeky kid and opening up my books, I would read that actually Brontosaurus didn't exist. It was a Patasaurus. This is the familiar thing from my childhood yeah. too. Yeah. And you try to show what a smart dino kid you are by saying actually. Actually. Yeah. Hold on. Um, and, and I was so wrong as a kid. Uh, because the more I have looked at the skulls, because 1995, Robert Bacher with his crew, found next to the neck, the skull of a brontosaurus, finally. And we from Morrison now have the snout of this dinosaur, the other half of the snout, still in the basement of the Peabody Museum. Um, Yale Peabody Museum, that is. Sorry, two Peabody Museums. And with the, the brain case and quadrates the back of the skull um, from Corey Tim, we can make a nice composite skull. And we're in the process of comparing and contrasting the morphologies, the shapes of these two skulls and then trying to place them back in the context of when these animals were living. Because it doesn't seem like they were living at the same time. So, long story short, they're wildly different dinosaurs. I think there are more anatomical differences between, geez, a patasaurus and brontosaurus than there are between a mule deer and a moose. Okay. Even though that's they're in the same family. That's a compelling comparison, yeah. right? right. Yeah. You can see a close relationship but yeah. it's, you wouldn't mistake one for the other. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and that's the same thing with, with these critters. Uh, and at the end of the day, what this is a lesson about is how science works. Mm -hmm. You know, we're out collecting data, and with the data that we have, we are making the best of it. Right. And, right. and we but make it's, provisional conclusions. Right, and, and yeah. the, these we're doing the best we can with the fossils we have, and, and by gosh, we, we do make mistakes, but we correct them when we right. get more data, and that's, really what this is all about. We're just trying to get a clearer picture of natural history through these fossils. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for explaining the apatosaurus brontosaurus thing to us. Yeah, it's boring. It really isn't. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, there you go. Yeah. Well, from beautiful Colorado, we're wishing you all the best. Thanks for watching. You want to give us an appendix and tell us what your favorite dinosaur is? What is my favorite oh, dinosaur? My favorite dinosaur is whichever dinosaur I happen to be studying at, at any time. They're like my well, kids. I can't, I can't play favorites.